Ich bin Sie. But on the other hand, the Middle East can seem very strange and exotic. Outlandish clothes and customs. Languages that don't seem to have any relation to our own. And even when we do pick up a few words of a Middle Eastern language, we still have trouble with the writing, which looks totally alien to us. Verbally and visually, we're lost. The Middle East is another world, and it doesn't seem to fit into our own historical landscape at all. When we think of the roots of our Western culture and civilization, we may look back to the Middle East of the very earliest times, to ancient Egypt, or Babylon, or biblical Israel, or the first Persian Empire. But we still feel that our main heritage really starts with the Greeks. And the Romans. And then we jump forward to the European Renaissance, which eventually leads us to modern times. But where are the Middle Easterners in all this? They don't seem to fit into any of the progression from Greeks to Romans to Renaissance to modern times. And yet, if we look more carefully at this progression, we see that there's something missing. The Roman Empire lasted from about 250 BC to roughly 500 AD. But the Renaissance didn't get going until about 1300 AD. What happened in between? There's an 800 year gap in our history between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. Did nothing happen during all these centuries? After all, we used to refer to this period as the Dark Ages, and the very word Renaissance means rebirth, which implies that we died when Rome died, and were only born again 800 years later. This idea that the world somehow ground to a halt after the fall of Rome is very deeply ingrained in our minds. And this is the main reason why we have so very little background knowledge of the Middle Easterners, why they're the blind spot in our vision of history. For the irony is that it was precisely during our so-called Dark Ages that the great Islamic civilization of the Middle Easterners reached its peak. In fact, they were the people who bridged the gap in our history, who wrote the missing chapter. If it hadn't been for the Muslims, we might never have had a Renaissance at all. All this began in what we used to regard as one of the most backward regions in the world. The Arabian Peninsula. In the town of Mecca, at the beginning of the seventh century of our era, when an Arab merchant by the name of Muhammad begins to have visions that the archangel Gabriel is asking him to recite the word of God the Arabic word for recitation is Qur'an, or Koran, as we pronounce it in English. And this becomes the holy book of the newly revealed religion of Islam, which will spread throughout the Arabian Peninsula, the Fertile Crescent, Iran, North Africa, and Spain, and even beyond the Middle East into India, and right up to the frontiers of China. This empire was the largest that the world had ever known. Then taking over such a vast territory, the Arabs also took over a vast amount of learning and culture.
The early Arab Muslims were themselves very simple Bedouin from the desert. Yet they managed to absorb a great deal of the art and science and philosophy of the ancient world. From the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, Iranians, the Indians, the Chinese. The great achievement of the Muslims was to synthesize all this and transmute it into a new world culture, the most obvious symbols of which are visual. Islamic architecture, domes and minarets, arches and alcoves. yards and fountains and pools. The very stamp of this civilization is Islamic design. The elaborate interweaving of calligraphy and abstract patterns. A geometrical dance that appears to go on forever. these intricate Islamic patterns arabesques, and this implies that they were a purely Arab invention. This isn't so. Like everything else in medieval Islam, they were a product of many different peoples. This was a truly cosmopolitan civilization. One of the best symbols of this is the medieval collection of folk tales, known as the Thousand and One Nights many of which are set in 8th century Baghdad in the days of the great caliph These stories of Aladdin, Sinbad the Sailor, Ali Baba, have also been called the Arabian Nights. But this is a misnomer because they actually came from many different places and feature not only Arab caliphs, but also Persian viziers, Jewish physicians, and Turkish soldiers. But there was always a very important Arab dimension to this Islamic civilization. After all, Islam itself started in Arabia and is based on the Koran, which God chose to reveal to mankind in the Arabic language. This means that for all Muslims, whatever their ethnic background, Arabic has always been considered a sacred language, the only conceivable medium 
in which Islamic culture could be expressed. The sacredness of the Arabic language also extended to the Arabic script itself. Even though the languages of the Iranians and the Turks, for instance, were quite different from Arabic, once these two peoples converted to Islam, they chose to write their languages in Arabic script, and Turkish continued to be expressed in Arabic characters right up until the 1920s. The Persian language is still written in Arabic letters even today. Of course, people in the Islamic Empire still went on speaking Persian or Turkish or Hebrew or Greek. But the official language of Islamic civilization was Arabic. And this gave an Arab flavor to everything. This is why Islamic designs came to be known as arabesque and why many of the artistic and scientific achievements of the Muslims have left their mark on the world in the form of literally thousands of Arabic words. Whenever you see an English word beginning with A-L, for instance, the chances are it comes to us via Arabic, because Al is simply Arabic for the. Alcove is from al Qubba, the dome. Almanac is from al Munakh the calendar, the record of what's happening in the skies. Algebra is from Aljabr, which means the reduction of arithmetic to a better form. Algorithm derives from the name of the Muslim mathematician, Al-Kharazmi. Alchemy stands for al kimya the chemistry, and so on. These words reflect some of the areas in which the Muslims excelled. Architecture, astronomy, mathematics, chemistry. The Muslim alchemists were looking for the elixir, another Arabic word, a special chemical preparation for turning base metals into gold and for prolonging life. They never found the elixir of life, but in searching for it, they laid the foundations of modern chemistry. They also made great strides in saving life and in healing the sick. They invented many new medical instruments. And made important breakthroughs in optics. And surgery. All of this may look primitive by today's standards, but we should remember that these are pictures from a thousand years ago, when Islamic medicine was much more advanced than anything going on in Europe. One of the most famous Muslim physicians was a 9th century Iranian by the name of Ar-Razi, who was known in the West as Razis, and who wrote many influential medical works. Another great Islamic physician and philosopher was also an Iranian, Ibn Sina, or Avicenna as the Europeans called him. Avicenna completed a medical encyclopedia at the beginning of the 10th century called the Canon of Medicine, which is the most famous single book in the history of medicine in both East and West, and which was used as the standard medical text throughout Europe until the 17th century. The Muslims not only did pioneering work as physicians, but along the way they also developed two institutions that had never been set up on an organized basis before the hospital, and the pharmacy. And they built a network of these therapeutic establishments throughout the Islamic world, so that wherever people traveled, they could have access to health care and medication. But the Muslims also believed that what happened on earth was very much influenced by what happened in the heavens. They were fascinated by astrology and astronomy. They perfected all sorts of elaborate instruments for measuring the movements of the stars and the planets, and gave us such words as zenith and nadir and azimuth. 
One of the most respected Muslim astronomers of the medieval period was yet another Iranian, a man called Omar Khayyam, who also wrote a set of poems called the Rubaiyat, which later became very well known in the West through the translations of Edward Fitzgerald. A book of verses underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou. Or a passage like this, which could reflect Kayam's interest in astronomy. Awake, for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. And lo, the hunter of the east has caught the sultan's turret in a noose of light. So between the 7th and the 12th centuries, the inhabitants of the Islamic empire made great progress in all areas of intellectual life, particularly in the sciences. But to do science, you need to do calculations. And to do calculations, you need numbers. And this is where the medieval Muslims made a contribution that each of us benefits from almost every day, when they replaced the cumbersome Roman numbers by a system that they imported from India, which was based on positional numbering and the idea of nothingness, or zero, which is another Arabic word. It's thanks to the Muslims that we no longer have to write the date, for example, like this, and instead can write it like this, in what have come to be known as Arabic numerals. Although, strictly speaking, they're Indian numerals. But if it hadn't been for the Arabic-speaking mathematicians of the Islamic Empire, they might never have reached the Western world. The same applies to the very paper on which we write our Arabic numerals. We might not have that either if the Muslims hadn't imported paper-making techniques from the Chinese. Numbers from India, paper from China. These are typical examples of the all-important role played by the medieval Muslims, not just in originating and inventing things from scratch themselves, but in rediscovering and interpreting and elaborating on things that originated elsewhere. They were the custodians of the learning of the ancient world, much of which might have passed into oblivion if it hadn't been for the Muslims. And this brings us to our own Renaissance, which began essentially with the rediscovery by European scholars of the works of such ancient Greek philosophers and scientists as Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, Hippocrates, and Galen. But the Europeans didn't rediscover the works of these great thinkers by reading them in their original Greek. They read them in Arabic translations, in such centers of Islamic learning as Baghdad and Damascus, Cairo and Cordoba, where the Muslims sponsored massive translation projects of classical Greek masterpieces. In the 10th and 11th centuries, scholars flocked to these cities from all over Europe to study the Greek classics in Arabic and eventually to translate these Arabic versions into the Latin of the Western world. But since the educational activity that went on in the great Islamic schools and mosques of the time drew not only on the learning of the Greeks, but also on the wisdom of the Chinese and the Indians, the Persians and the Jews, in a very real sense, this was universal learning. So it's hardly surprising that this is where the very idea of the university itself was born. The mosque of El-Azhar in Cairo is, in fact, the world's oldest university. It was founded in 970 AD and is still going strong today. Classes at El-Azhar continue to be conducted in medieval fashion, with all the students sitting at the feet of their professor, who was the only one to have a chair. This may well be where the idea of the chair of philosophy or history at a university comes from. It's even been argued that other traces of Islamic influence can be seen in the academic gowns that undergraduates still wear in the West, which bear a striking resemblance to the flowing robes of the Muslims. <laughs> All of this may help to explain some of the mixed feelings that many modern Middle Easterners have concerning our modern Western high-tech civilization. 
They regard it with a mixture of awe and condescension. On the one hand, they are envious of all the scientific and technological progress that we've made. On the other hand, they can't help remembering who got us started on this path of progress in the first place. Those medieval Muslims who were the torchbearers of culture and civilization for more than 500 years, who lit up our dark ages, and whose great empire once seemed poised to take over the entire world. In the year 732, the Muslims even got as far as Poitiers in France, where they were defeated in a decisive battle by the Frankish ruler Charles Martel. Historians have often tried to imagine what might have happened had the Muslims won that Battle of Poitiers. Would people be speaking Arabic in the streets of London today? But this is idle speculation, because the Muslims lost. Or did they? In the West, we're used to very small families, a father, a mother, and a couple of children. But in the Middle East, things are different. The traditional family is very large, with several generations all living together under the same roof or cluster of roofs. One of the reasons for having such large families in the Middle East is geographic. 90% of the region consists either of desert or of barren mountains. environment of extremes, extreme dryness, extreme heat, and extreme cold. It's hard for individuals or for small family groups to survive in such conditions. There's safety in numbers, so families tend to be as large as possible. But you need someone very strong to lead a large family. And in the Middle East, this function has traditionally been performed by a father figure, a patriarch. And the family needs manpower, so the patriarch needs to have as many sons as possible. And he will want them to remain with him, so that their sons, in turn, will add to the size of the family. 
and so on. This extended patriarchal family is the basic social structure of the Middle East, and it has a profound effect on almost every aspect of life. Your very name in Arabic puts you in a family context. Ibn Saud, son of Saud, or Abu Bassam, father of Bassam. It's the same in Hebrew, where the equivalent of Ibn is Ben, Ben Meir, the son of Meir. And as we've seen, both the Jews and the Arabs trace their ancestry back through the most famous Middle Eastern patriarch of all, Abraham. We always think of Abraham as an old man, which is appropriate. Patriarchs are by definition old, since they're the heads of families consisting of several generations. The Arabic word for old man is sheikh, or in English, sheikh. And since old men are so important in the Middle East, this has become a general term of respect. For example, the countries along the Arab side of the Persian Gulf, which the Arabs call the Arab Gulf, are called sheikhdoms, because they are ruled by heads of families who are also heads of state. In the patriarchal world of the Middle East, family and state are often one and the same thing, and some of the ruling families in the Persian Gulf have been in power for over 200 years. Until a short time ago, the same thing applied to the other side of the Persian Gulf, to Iran, which was also ruled for centuries by a series of families. most recent being the Pahlavi family. And of course, the Turkish Ottoman Empire was ruled by the family of Osman, or Rahman, from whom the name Ottoman is derived. And the Ottoman family ruled from the 14th century right up until 1922. But the most powerful family in the Middle East today is the Saud family which has ruled over Saudi Arabia for most of this century. There are now believed to be about 10,000 members of the House of Saud, making it probably the largest royal family on earth. But even in those Middle Eastern countries no longer under direct family rule, family ties still play a very significant role, both in politics and in business. It's considered perfectly proper and natural for a politician or a businessman to try to surround himself with as many of his relatives as he can. In the West, we call this nepotism, literally favoritism toward nephews. But in the Middle East, it's the socially responsible thing to do. You look after the needs of your family before everything else. Trades have also traditionally been organized along family lines. The goldsmiths would all tend to be related to one another, as would the potters. And the weavers. One very agreeable side effect of the power of the family in the Middle East is the tradition of hospitality. Since your identity depends almost entirely on your kinship, on your family, a man separated from his family may find himself in very dire straits. He's in a kind of social limbo. For survival, he must be able to rely on the hospitality of those families he meets. All Middle Easterners recognize this. This is why they will share almost everything they have with a stranger. And this habit of sharing belongs to a general tradition of almsgiving that is common to all Middle Eastern peoples. 
طب احنا عايز سنة In the oil-rich countries of Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf, the sharing of the wealth is so widespread that poverty has been virtually eliminated. Education and health care are free. Housing is heavily subsidized. And in Saudi Arabia, at the age of maturity, every young man is eligible for a substantial interest-free loan from the government to help him establish a home. But so far, everything I've said about the Middle Eastern family has been limited to men. What about the women? Well, the position of women in the Middle East follows from the patriarchal system itself. In order to have sons, the patriarch must, of course, have a wife, but he wants to have as many sons as possible, so he will try to have several wives. So the patriarchal family, by its very nature, tends toward polygamy. Not that polygamy has ever been very widespread in the Middle East. Most men simply cannot afford more than one wife, but the tendency is there nonetheless. Even today, although only about 1% of marriages are polygamous, polygamy is still legal in every country in the Middle East except Tunisia and Turkey. But wives don't always produce sons. What happens to the daughters? Well, since this is such a male-oriented society, they automatically have lower status. And their position is weakened still further by the fact that unlike the sons, the daughters do not stay with their father after they get married. They always go to live with their husband's family. This means that the male side of the patriarchal family remains intact, while the female side is in a constant state of flux. Women in the Middle East are the means by which men can produce more men, more sons. Women are always defined in terms of men. But this works both ways. Men are also defined in terms of women. Again, the roots of this go back to the very harsh Middle Eastern environment. Men usually had very few possessions, very few status symbols. Their status had to depend upon their own behavior. This led to a very powerful tradition of manliness, of personal courage and honor. Since the Middle Eastern family is so tightly knit, everyone in it is responsible for everyone else. In particular, the men are responsible for the women. So a man's honor depends to an enormous extent on the behavior of the women in his family particularly on their sexual behavior. Therefore, the women have to be protected at all costs, both for the honor of the family and for the honor of the men. This is why, in many parts of the Middle East, you see very few women in public places. And those who do appear are usually dressed extremely modestly. And in some regions, 
They even cover their faces with veils. But in general, women keep away from public places and spend most of their lives in their homes, which are specially designed to prevent people from seeing in. The traditional Middle Eastern house turns in upon itself, and all its activities are centered around an interior courtyard. The Arabic word for something that is forbidden is haram, and the related word harim, or as we pronounce it harem, refers to the inner sanctum of the traditional Middle Eastern household, where the women and children live protected from the gaze of strangers. But although harem is an Arabic word, this idea of a special sanctuary for women isn't confined to Arab countries. It also exists in Iran and Turkey. The reason that an Arabic word is so widely used for the women's sanctuary is because Arabic is the language of Islam. And Islam has come to be closely associated with the seclusion of women. Not that the Muslims invented seclusion. Far from it. In fact, before the coming of Islam in the 7th century, in the Byzantine Empire, for example, the women in most households were confined to a separate apartment known as the gynecheum. The ancient Persians also had their equivalent of the harem. And both Byzantine and Persian women wore veils long before the advent of Islam. But quite apart from the question of seclusion and veiling, most of the ancient world had a very low opinion of women. Aristotle described them as inferior beings, and Roman law categorized them as legal incompetence. In most of the Middle East, men could have as many wives as they pleased. And in some parts of the ancient world, boy babies were valued so much more highly than girl babies that female infants were sometimes put to death. It was one of the first accomplishments of Islam to introduce sweeping reforms in the treatment of women. Female infanticide was outlawed almost immediately. The number of wives a man might have was limited to four, and a whole range of legal rights for women were established including the right to inherit property and retain ownership of it after marriage. From a 7th century perspective, this was a great improvement in the lot of women. But by and large, the legal rights that Islam extended to women still remained much less generous than those enjoyed by men. Although Islamic law limited polygamy, it did still sanction it. There are also many passages in the Quran which stress the inferiority of women. Men stand superior to women in that God hath preferred the one over the other. And there are verses which argue for the modesty of women. Say to the believing women that they cast down their looks and guard their privy parts and display not their ornaments. Since Islamic law is based on the Koran, which is the direct word of God, it can't be questioned. So Islam both sanctifies and preserves the patriarchal family and its attitude towards women. But of course, the emancipation of women varies enormously across the Middle East. At one end of the spectrum, there are some parts of some very westernized cities, such as Beirut, where women have as much freedom as anywhere in the world. And at the other extreme, there are countries such as Saudi Arabia, where Muslim women must still cover themselves completely when they appear in public, and where the very severe Islamic punishments for adultery are still in force even today.
And all across the Middle East, it's generally true that the stricter the application of traditional Islamic law, the lower the status of women. In many of these countries, until quite recently, education has been for boys only. With the result that over 80% of Middle Eastern women still cannot read or write, as compared with an illiteracy rate of about 60% for the men. But the effect of the patriarchal family on women is by no means always negative. Women may be secluded, but that means that they're also protected. They're cocooned in a warm, secure, and loving family atmosphere. There's a very powerful group feeling within the family networks a strong sense of shared responsibility. For example, although it may appear easy for a man to divorce a woman, it's not so in reality because he too shares the loss of honor that this brings to the family. And even if he does leave her, one of her male relatives will automatically take over the responsibility of looking after her. In the patriarchal family, there's always someone to come to your help. There are many psychological advantages to this, both for men and for women. Statistics seem to indicate that people in general are much happier in the Middle East than they are in the West where the number of deaths from suicide or mental disorder is some 20 times higher than it is in the Middle East. The crime rates throughout the Middle East are also astonishingly low by Western standards. But of course, with ever-increasing Westernization and industrialization, it's getting more and more difficult to hold the traditional patriarchal family together. And if this family setup falls apart, the whole fabric of Middle Eastern society disintegrates, which is exactly what is happening today. In many areas, families are being fragmented into small units, and many of the old guidelines for behavior are breaking down this is part of the reason for the current social turmoil in the Middle East. Things are changing very fast indeed, and there are inevitable reactions to this. Desperate attempts to keep the traditional society intact. Many people are turning back to the fundamental teachings of Islam, Some women are putting on their veils again and reverting to their traditional family roles. The seclusion of the Middle Eastern woman is by no means over. But there is another side to this. Seclusion doesn't mean that there is no romance in the Middle East. Indeed, there is a very long tradition of Arabic love poetry, which dates back to the pre-Islamic period, when the poet nearly always began by shedding tears over the abandoned encampment of his beloved. Stop here, let's weep for a long remembered love and this place where she set her camp. And here are a couple of lines from one of the most famous poems in the Persian language, an ode by Hafez. Agar on Torka Shirazi, Bedastara Dele Mara. If that Shirazi maid would take my heart in hand, then would I give for her beauty mark Bokhara and Samarkand. 
In fact, some Westerners have been so captivated by the Middle Eastern love tradition that they've argued that the whole idea of courtly love and of chivalry and gallantry towards women, which was first introduced into Europe by the medieval troubadours of southern France, actually derived from the love poetry of the Muslims in Spain. So perhaps there is more to the veil than meets the eye. 